Okay. And you can go. Okay. Welcome to this presentation by the Larimer County branch of the League of Women Voters. We are really delighted to have so many interested in this presentation. Of course, if you've chosen to live in Colorado, we know you care about the environment. First, about the League. The most fundamental basis for the League of Women Voters is that we are nonpartisan. That means we do not stand for or promote any political party or candidate for office. That does not mean we are not political. When we engage, we advocate and educate around positions that have been developed by League members over the past 101 years. The three main categories you consider are governmental policies, social policies, and natural resource policies. Our motto is making democracy work. And this session falls under natural, natural resources policies. Okay, second, um, our speakers. We have two speakers tonight. Uh, Cindy Lindefelder will start off with a, a brief discussion. She is in her fifth year of the League of Women Voters of Larimer County. She's on the board of directors heading diversity, equity, and inclusion outreach. She's on the environmental action team serving as the pollinator habitat group facilitator and is a member of People and Pollinator Action Network. And those last two are the main reason that she will be speaking. Um, our main speaker is Kathy Meyer. And you may have seen the Reporter Herald on Monday, February 19th, had a front page report on Kathy's work. The article is long, detailed, and has lengthy answers to some of the questions you may have. Um, you can find that article later to refresh your memory, but there will also be a recording of today's presentation on our website about Kathy. Um, she's originally from the Finger Lakes region of New York State, uh, one that I particularly love. That's where I started hiking. She has a master's in linguistics, has careers, her careers were in federal civil service, and she and her husband chose to retire in Colorado, where they live on some dry, rocky acreage in mm -hmm. West Loveland, Loveland foothills. She's prioritized stewardship of that land in her retirement. She has a very busy retirement. Joining the Colorado Native Plant Society and Wild Ones Front Range taking CSU Extension Certified Colorado Gardener and Native Plant Master Courses, and attending Larimer County Land Management Workshops since 2014 to guide her gardening and restoration. She and her botanist daughter are working to catalog all the species growing on family property. And since 2018, she's led efforts to design, fund, install, and maintain native plant demonstration gardens in Loveland natural areas. And she has been organizing environmental education and citizen science activities at these places. She's also been operating a small landscaping consultation and design business, helping area homeowners replace lawns and reno renovate landscaping with native plants. Lastly, our process tonight. Cindy will speak first. Use the chat function or raise your hand if you have questions. And Kathy Wilson and I will give them to the speakers when uh, Cindy is done. She's basically giving an introduction. Uh, the main speaker after Cindy will be Kathy Mayer. And again, use the chat functions or the raised hand functions for questions and we'll convey them in order once she is done. This is a complex topic really complex. Don't expect to remember everything you hear tonight, <laughs> but you can go to the Reporter Herald to refresh your memory and you will be able to capture what happens tonight on video after this, okay? Uh, Kathy, anything I need to add? No, sounded good to me. How about you, Kathy? Sounds good. Okay, Cindy then, you can begin. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm happy to come to Loveland, Colorado. I'm actually in Fort Collins, 
where we started our pollinator habitat group, but are rapidly expanding into all parts of Larimer County. One of the things I frequently hear when I'm out and about is the League of Women Voters has a pollinator habitat group <laughs> and they shake their head. And it gives me an opportunity, of course, to talk to them about it. But I wanted to bring this group up to speed, kind of how that happened. Um, um, what Fran did say is we do in the league take positions after considerable study. And the League of Women Voters of the United States believes that natural resources should be managed as interrelated parts of life supporting ecosystems. Resources should be conserved and protected to assure future availability. So we plugged into that as well as the state stance on natural resources. Um, in our pollinated group, we do believe that climate change, habitat loss, which will be key to the presentation tonight is the habitat. Pesticides and disease are some of the leading factors leading to our decline in pollinators. So our group does meet monthly for business type things, but then our main role is to advocate and to educate. Um, some of the things that we're advocating for right now, particular to Loveland County, is a pollinator resolution. Uh, our league did uh, offer a letter of support in August to the City Council of Loveland. And I've asked Kathy to uh, post in the chat room where you can access that resolution, take a look at it, hopefully you'll support it, sign it, and let your City Council know that that is happening. Um, that there are people out there paying attention. Um, the other thing we're studying and not haven't taken a stance on, but it, it fits in what we do, is some of the pesticides bills that will be going into the General Assembly legislation this um, session. And one will have to do with local pesticides. So as we go forward, our group will take a look at that and then uh, get the inf information out to folks as it becomes available to us. Um, let me see. Collaboration is huge within the pollinator community. Uh, I mentioned that I'm part of this group and People in Pollinator Action Network. Kathy plugs into native plants, uh, wild ones, People in Pollinator Action Network. But we're also working with in Fort Collins right now with our city um, zero escape programs. Uh, Kathy had the opportunity last summer to plug into the Loveland Parks Department in which a project was completed in Larimer, um, well, Larimer County, but at the Sunset Vista Natural Area, just on the edge of Loveland. So if you're out there walking or hiking, um, that required tons of planning by Kathy, coordinating volunteers, and then getting all of the different organizations, including the League of Women Voters, out to plant those native plants for that area. You see, we participated in the Loveland Honey Bee Festival last year. A uh, couple in the room here did as well. We um, talked about some of the policies through uh, People and Pollinator Action Network and the League of Women Voters. And let's see, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, of course, Highland um, High Plains Environmental Center is a huge resource for us and that we have toured it and we reach out to them and they also offer presentations for our group um, to catch everyone up to speed. What, what's really great about this group is you can be a master gardener extraordinaire, like Kathy, I'm looking at you, Kathy, to <laughs> hobbyist, to just getting into pollinators and wanna learn about it and be impactful. Um, and we don't do just meetings. We get out in the community, we do outreach, we plant, we seed. And one canopy nursery in Loveland is an ally of ours in that they share plant uh, nursery space with us so we can um, demonstrate planting and seeding and, uh, and then eventually giving those native plants away. So I think I'm gonna stop with that. We do promote food, shelter, and water as the habitat needs of our pollinators. And my final word, and maybe Kathy will bring it up too, is this weekend is gonna be gorgeous. Yeah. But please restrain from cleaning out your gardens. Our native 
pollinators <laughs> need to stay there for a while and and um, prepare themselves. So I, I don't know, it's kind of the rule of thumb after Mother's Day, but just let's not do it this weekend. Um, if you want, you can plant a beautiful pot and stick it in your front yard. So but, um, please reach out to the League of Women Voters, Larimer County. Uh, we do have a pollinator webpage there or site that you can go to, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Oh, Fran okay. has a question. Oh, uh, I, I don't I don't have a question. I was looking for the chat. I can't find it. Look right above the show chat um previews. It should uh -huh. say Ah, got it. Okay. <laughs> Very good. I, okay. I have a question, Cindy. Could you say the name of the nursery with which you partner? Yes, it's one canopy nursery. Uh, okay. Right off the I-25 in Loveland, um, they are a nonprofit nursery that grow tree seedlings for restoration purposes across the state. Ooh, nice. Is, yes. Um, and shrubs, and too. Very, pardon? And shrubs, too. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they let us grow our... our uh, hold our workshops there, which, and then grow our plants. We were doing it out in our backyards in the snow for a couple of years. So this has been a nice, nice treat. I think, uh, I think it's just, their, this is their second year of operation, right? They're, they're new. They're really new. They're really new. Yeah. If we have no further questions, we can go on to uh, Kathy. I think Claudia had a, a question. Okay. Oh, Claudia, unmute. Sorry, uh, Cindy, where are they located? Yeah. Oh, I don't have the direct address, but it's, um, it's I'll have it's to 14. get it and put it in the chat for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's sorry 14, about that. It's 14th Street in Loveland out thank toward I-25. Okay. okay. Is that 14th Street Southwest? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Or is that, e I don't know if it's west that or east or south, the south part. South <laughs> yeah. I, I think yeah. that's 402. I think it, it is 402. 402. Yeah. 402. I think of it as 14th Street, but it's 402. Okay. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will say it's not a nursery that's open to the public. Um, although I think during open hours, if you want to tour okay. it or something, I would give them a call. It, it, it's They're doing great work. And I'm going to do one more plug for our group. Um, the Pollinator Habitat Group in Larimer County is the only one so far that I have found in Colorado. And um, our goal, of course, is to get other chapters involved so our pollinators have a safe migration pattern as well. So there's that. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come. Lovely. <laughs> Kathy? Okay, I think I'll... I just wanted to mention, uh, Cindy Cindy mentioned a project we did last year in Sunset Vista, and I happen to notice at least one person here besides Cindy that participated in that project. Holly Gordon is here tonight. Mm. Um, she was one of our uh, planters. I So <laughs> thanks, Holly, and anyone else. There's so many people here. I can't, didn't, didn't notice know. anybody else. Oh, there you are. Thanks, yeah. all of you who participated in that project. It was um we had really great support for that, and it, it was a wonderful thing. So it'd be nice to see what uh, pops up out of the ground this year, see what survived. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen, I hope. And we'll get rolling. I'll get there soon. <laughs> OK. I think you see my slides now? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to just pause here on this um, title slide for a bit to let you know that I am going to give um, some specifics on some plants coming up later on, but some of these plants I'm not going to include at the end with descriptions or anything. So, and, and they're noted, the names of them are noted um, on the photos. So if there's something that you see 
uh, jot it down if you like it. And uh, I, I will be providing plant lists to everybody that came here later so I can give you all the information that you need on, on all the plants that are in this slide presentation and others at the end. So, um, all right, so let's get rolling. What we're gonna cover is what native means, uh, what ecoregion you and your plants live in, we're gonna talk a little bit about what's wrong with using non-native plants in our landscapes. Uh, we're gonna talk about keystone species, species and eventually we'll get around to telling you what are the some of the, some of the best plants to plant in Larimer County. Uh, then we'll hopefully have time for Q&A. I hope everybody knows the Rocky Mountain bee plant because it is one spectacular plant we have. Uh, it's an annual, if you didn't know, and uh, it's not it's not included on my list of pollinator plants, but it's one heck of a pollinator plant. So um, just make a note of that one. If you if you're looking for annuals, it's wonderful. Uh, so what's a native plant? You probably already know this, so we're gonna just scoot right through it. Uh, it's a plant that's been naturally occurring in some place for millennia. And uh, we usually think of it as being there before there was any kind of human activity that would have disrupted anything. It's co-evolved with all the other flora and fauna. And because it's co-evolved like that, it's part of a natural established food web and ecosystem. Uh, and also because of this co-evolution and uh, being in a place for a long time, it's adapted physically, chemically, and genetically to that location. Uh, I do want to stop briefly to mention that native does not mean the same thing as xeric. Native is not equal to xeric. Xeric is not equal to eight native. There are plenty of xeric plants that aren't native, and there are plenty of native plants that aren't xeric. So just um, to clarify that point, because it, it's really important to make sure you understand that. So where do we draw the line when we're talking about a native definition? Is it Colorado? Is it a region of a couple of states, three states, five states? Or is it the Great Plains or the Rocky Mountains? Or is it the entirety of North America? Um, it varies. And that's something you also have to zero in on and make sure you have your mind clear on what what you mean when you say native, because when you go to vendors, they're not always gonna share your definition of native. So you wanna know exactly what you're looking for. And uh, the best way to do that is to have a list of scientific names when you go shopping. So you know you pick the ones for whatever region that you're interested in uh, replicating. So, um, Regions and ecoregions eco are really the boundaries that native plants care about and wild, wildlife care about when they establish themselves in an area, right? I mean, this is, this is mm -hmm. common sense, but we'll just go through it because some of these resources are the best you'll find when you dig into the ecoregions uh, and various places, websites, they, they will start telling you all the things you need to know about the wildlife and the, the plant life that uh, grows in that area. So uh, I wanted to show you this map from the Xerxes Society because it, it breaks things down very nicely so you can get a good picture of uh, what when we're talking native, these are the kinds of questions you have to ask yourself. Where am I on that map? What's native to me? What's native to my region? And you can see where we live in Colorado, it's kind of at the intersection of three different regions. So when you're going poking around these websites, you'll be interested in looking at plants, depending on what your little uh, micro region is around your house, um, you'll be looking for an eco region that shares most characteristics with that, what you have in your yard. So, uh, and each of these eco, eco regions, as you can imagine, has distinct plant, plant communities and wildlife communities. So, uh, that's that's how we want to think about native. <clears throat> so getting into our area here, the eco regions in Colorado, we have they they break it down into different kinds of levels. And and level three level three eco regions we have uh, we have six of in Colorado. 
and um, Larimer County has three. And if you look at Larimer County here, you can see the three that are there. We have the High Plains, the Southern Rockies, and that little bit of the Wyoming Basin popping in. So uh, if you're shopping for native plants, you want to think about uh, which area am I in? Am I in a plains area, a basin area? Well, we're not in south, southern Larimer County or the southern Rockies. Um, so then it gets a little more complicated. If you really want to look at it, they've broken it down into 35, broken Colorado down into 35 level four ecoregions. So you can see the level of detail that uh, the distinct plant communities might come in and wildlife and different geology. So all of these regions have very specific geology, vegetation, hydrology, climate, the soils, and the land use. They're all, they all have their specifics and choosing plants that, uh, that are adapted well to those different situations is what, what you are really thinking about. So Larimer County has eight of these level four um, ecoregions. So let's see what they are, if I can get my slide to advance. So here's a very blurry zoom in of that Larimer County. And you can try to, oops, you can try to take a look at um, where where you live. But uh, so so we have, I don't know. It's it's kind of interesting to recognize that we have all these different eco regions in this one county, but it it is kind of a big county. But we go from the flat, uh, rolling plains all the way up into alpine zone in Rocky Mountain National Park, <clears throat> and we are way out here. This is where most of the people live in these uh, front range fans. Uh, and uh, here's where I live in this little purple, well, not up there, but uh, the, the purple area. I live in the shrublands in the foothills. So in each, each one of these is different and you're gonna have different plant communities that are native to those areas. So how do you know what's native when you go shopping? How do you know uh, what's native in your area? I, I like, there's two references that I particularly like. And one is this thing called uh, BONAP, the Biota of North America program. That's a terrific online resource if you're interested. And they've, uh, they show you, you, you put in the name of a plant, uh, you have to know the scientific name, but that's easy to find. <clears throat> you put in the name of the plant and it will spit out a map of uh, where that plant is native in the, in the, well, North America or mainly the US. And the colors mean different things, of course. So brown means it's not native at all in that area um, or not present at all. The, the, so that species is not present at all. The dark green, it's, uh, it's present in the state but and native. Uh, the light green means it's present in the county and not rare. So each one of these counties, the, this particular plant, which is the nodding onion that I looked up, the nodding onion is native in Larimer County and it's not rare. Uh, the yellow means it's native and rare. And uh, the, uh, pink the, means, pink. the pink means it's, uh, it's noxious. So somebody, somebody in that jurisdiction has declared it a noxious weed, which is unusual for native plants to uh, be called that. It's usually, that's against the definition of noxious, but there you are. So, you can look at a resource like this and get immersed in the colors and the rabbit holes that you can go down there. Or you can consult a book like The Flora of Colorado that the Colorado Native Plant Society uh, relies on for determining nativeness and uh, how to describe plants and identify them. Or you can just buy plants from Loveland's High Plains Environmental Center where everything they sell is uh, might not be native to Larimer County, but it's native to the um, uh, region that we live in and everything will be suitable for growing in our climate. Hold on, I have a dog situation. Len, are you looking for the, the dog? James, come on. James, you gotta have it on the side. 
Okay, so um, that if you're not familiar with it, the High Plains Environmental Center is a really wonderful um, gem that the city of Loveland has. And um, they are starting to sell out earlier and earlier in the season now. So they, they're becoming known and their stock is wonderful. It's really healthy. So I just want to put in a plug there for a Loveland resource that's really tremendous. Um, so if you are interested in protecting pollinators and preserving diversity and having a yard that's e ecologically functional as well as beautiful, you want to aim for at least 70% native plants in your yard. So then that means 70% of the vegetative cover in your yard ideally would be native plants, native to your area, because you're trying to accommodate and serve those uh, the local invertebrates that support the entire food web. Um, so <clears throat> those plants that if you, if you use uh, at least 70% native plants, you're gonna be using less water if you're choosing them properly by ecoregion and what your, what your property can offer a plant um, in terms of soil and sun and moisture. Um, so you'll be more likely to support all the needs of our local pollinators, especially those, well, they have these uh, invertebrates that are called specialists that rely on particular plants for pollen or nectar or something. They, they need those plants. They just don't do any plant. They have to have particular ones. And so if you have these plants that cater to the specialist butterflies and the specialist bees, You'll, you'll make sure you're supporting those species in our wildlife spectrum. Um, and with 70% native plants, you're going to uh, have a better chance of ensuring that birds are gonna find enough larva to feed their young uh, and uh, enough host species to support the ecosystem. And, and all of that ensures you've got, you, you'll preserve biodiversity and all in all get a greater ecological bang for your buck. Uh, I will stop to say a few words about what's wrong with um, non-native plants. And often there's absolutely nothing wrong with na non-native plants, but you, you should really think about it a little bit before you choose anything for your yard that's not native to this area because they have an uncertain value to pollinators. We just don't know because they evolved in some other region of the world or region of the United States. They might not serve the invertebrate population the way a native plant would. So uh, the butterfly bush, you've, I'm sure you've all heard of, is a really good example of this. It does really well catering to the needs of adult butterflies, but uh, apparently uh, studies have shown that there's not a caterpillar in North America that will eat the leaves. So it's kind of a waste in that respect. You could put in a native shrub that would, that would cater to the entire life, system, life cycle of uh, many invertebrates uh, rather than a, a shrub that might only serve one part of a life cycle. So uh, the other thing about natives that, uh, non-natives that is um, kind of insidious is you, you don't really know whether they'll become invasive or not until you plant it and see. Um, and so I did last year, I was kind of curious how many plants on our Colorado Department of Agriculture weed list are um, garden escapes. So how, how many of our listed weeds began life here in Colorado as imported ornamentals or garden escapes? And I did the math and figured out 39% of them meet that definition. And that kind of blew my mind that, you know, that number of our weeds started out as imported ornamentals. So um, it's just something to think about because we, we just don't know. And I've had a, a number of problems in my yard where I planted things that I thought that were non-native that I thought were uh, perfectly fine to use, but they turned out to be um, really, really aggressive and 
I had to rip them out because I live in a rural area and I didn't want them blowing around and contaminating the rest of the uh, Colorado landscape here. So I just wanted to show you a few of those that I, um, I'll show them to you a bit later, which ones that kind of uh, messed up my yard. So this one, this bone app again, the bone app blue is when an exotic species has gone wild. And that uh, on the last slide, this, this uh, grass, um, this Chinese silver grass is a really common landscaping plant. And they have found it is um, becoming invasive in parts of the US. And so I wanted to show you that that one right here in uh, on the right side, uh, that Chinese silver grass is starting to become a problem in Boulder County. So it's starting to, to spread um, outside of gardens and naturalize itself. So it's kind of interesting because a lot of these plants that are introduced into the landscaping trade um, uh, do really well out east and then they come they become uh, invasive weeds out east and we're not as affected out here by that invasiveness because our climate is so different they the plants tend not to uh, become invasive the way they do out out east where there's more moisture but there are some that do do that so I just wanted to add throw in this word of caution that we have to think about the non-natives even the so-called sterile ones like this um, Feather reed grass, the Carl Forster, I'm sure you've seen it. It's in uh, landscapes all over the place. It's a wonderful structural plant, it's beautiful grass. But unfortunately, even though it's sterile, I think, you know, mutations happen and that has started to uh, naturalize itself in Logan County in Colorado, which is kind of interesting. So, um, even though it's a beautiful grass and it serves a wonderful landscape purpose, there's no reason why we can't use a native grass that looks very similar and would have the benefits of serving pollinators and, and other species, as well as not having to make us worry about it becoming an invasive species. So some other landscaping favorites that have gone bad, uh, just for your information, if you're not aware of this burning bush, not a problem in Colorado so far, but out east, it's become a uh, declared noxious weed in 21 states. Uh, calorie pear trees or Bradford pear trees, which you've seen line city streets all over the country, uh, is now banned in, uh, in three states and listed invasive in 15. Uh, common periwinkle. I grew up with that in my yard. And uh, so that's now listed in 14 states. And the butterfly bush, which we talked about before, is invasive in nine states. So uh, all of these are not problems in Colorado. They may never become problems in Colorado because of a very different climate. But it just sort of gives you the the warning that you don't know how these non-natives are going to behave um, until you plant them and they start causing trouble, like these did for my garden. So these are what I call the next next gen noxious weeds, um, the cat mints. You've probably seen them them go crazy, or any mint. Any mint will really go crazy, reseeding itself. And uh, cat mints are often in included as uh, or nurse or landscaping plants for xeriscapes because they don't need a lot of water but they are prolific spreaders. Even the sterile hybrids, um, the sterile cultivars are uh, mutate. And I found one that was supposedly a, a sterile cultivar that I got from Garden in a Box spread horrifically around my yard. So I don't know if it was mislabeled or we had a serious mutation happen or what was going on, but that was a mess. So I don't... I don't go near campments anymore. Uh, the sapphire blue sea holly is an absolutely gorgeous plant with stunning iridescent blooms uh, that attracts pollinators like you can't imagine. It I've never seen so many bees on different kinds of bees, on but this plant 
became so aggressive in my yard, I had to, I had to get rid of it because it was spreading all, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet away. It was getting, uh, seeding itself. So uh, another one, Russian sage, which is ubiquitous here. I'm afraid that is going to, uh, be a listed weed before, uh, too much longer. So just some things to think about, um, the danger of non-native plants. So what are keystone species? Um, they make it all work. Uh, these are plants that are unique to a food web. They are absolutely essential to many local species to complete their life cycles. And for that reason, they're critical to sustaining a diverse uh, ecosystem. So the key, they're keystone plants because they're key to the ecosystem and removing them will cause serious degradation or could cause the whole system to collapse. So what we want to make sure is we have enough of these keystone plants in our, in our land areas uh, that are you know, connected land areas. So, so invertebrates and the species that rely on them can find them, complete their life cycles and support all the other uh, wildlife in the chain to uh, keep, uh, preserve, preserve a diverse and functional ecosystem. Without these, the, according to the National Wildlife Federation, without the keystone plants, you would have uh, a lot fewer butterflies, native bees, and birds. They just won't thrive without these uh, keystone plants in the in our landscapes. And our terrestrial birds, 96% of our terrestrial birds rely on the insects that these keystone plants support. So those are the kind of, that's the really simple information about keystone plants that will show you right away why they're so important to have in our landscapes. And, uh, if you can incorporate them in your yard, you'll be doing a great deal to support these invertebrates that are so necessary to our lives. So now we will get into the list of plants, the best, what I think are the, the best uh, native plants for our environment here. Uh, this is one, on this slide, I, I didn't include this, um, uh, Monarda fistulosa, the bee balm, our local bee balm in the in the list, not because it's not a terrific pollinator plant. It is. It's one of the best pollinator plants for sure. Um, it's just not one of those high ranking keystone plants, but I didn't want to pass it by but without giving it a mention because it's a wonderful garden plant. And uh, it also is a heck of a pollinator plant. So, so don't definitely don't overlook that one. So the first, uh, the keystone species I'm going to talk about are sunflowers. Um, they're hugely important for the ecosystem. You wouldn't think such a simple common plant would be doing such hard work, but heck, it is. So we have six species that are native to Larimer County. Two are those really rather scraggly ones you see everywhere that uh, people have strong opinions about, whether pro or con. But the Helianthus petiolaris and Helianthus annuus are uh, two that you will see. They're, they look very similar. Um, they're annuals, uh, and but look at the the uh, invertebrate life that they support. So specialist bees of all kinds, uh, caterpillar species. These are important plants in our landscape. So if you have, oh, oh yeah, not to mention the birds. And I, I don't know how many of you see uh, we've got two two types of goldfinches in this area, um, the American goldfinch and the lesser goldfinch. Both of them go crazy over this plant. And so if you like goldfinches, these uh, definitely attract them. So if you have them in your yard, and you probably most or all of you do, I would say keep at least some of them. They're important to, important to have. Um, they get a little scraggly and... Uh, some people say unsightly, but they serve a tremendous purpose. They're real powerhouses. Helianthus pumilus is a, the bush sunflower. You might not be so familiar with this one, but I can guarantee you've seen it blooming all over the foothills every summer. 
it covers the hillsides by where I live. Um, it's a perennial <clears throat> and it's much shorter than the normal, uh, the, the classic sunflower that you think of. It only gets to be about 24 or 20 inches tall. Um, and it has a bush habit. So it's, it's very, the, the, the stems get quite stiff and shrubby. Uh, and uh, I will say you, you kind of need to cut this one back. If you have anything that's, uh, that require, like a garden area that requires some sort of tidying up uh, in the early, in early summer or late spring, I would say you have to cut this back um, to make it look like, because the, the stems get quite floppy on the ground, the old stems. So, uh, but this one, look at the uh, hosts more than 50 caterpillar species and over 80 specialist bees. Uh, this one too, I see tons of goldfinches in these and gross beaks all the time. It does prefer a dry or rocky soil. Um, and this one, I wanted to recommend it in particular for hell strips. People often ask me what to use in their hell strips or parking strips, whatever you call them, out by the road. If you're responsible for one of those strips out by the road, uh, this is one of those species that is short enough that it's not going to get a, um, obscure vision for anybody driving. And it is in uh, and it will cover some ground. It takes no supplemental water once you get it established. It's a fabulously drought tolerant plant. Uh, and it's got, it blooms all season. It blooms a long, long time. Um, if, if anybody uh, attended the um, uh, Camille Dungy's talk uh, a week or so ago, uh, she mentioned Thomas Nuttle. Uh, Thomas Nuttle, named a lot of our plants as he went ex exploring. Um, and uh, so a lot of our plants are named after him. So this sunflower is an example of one of the plants uh, that was named after after Thomas Nuttall, the bio British biologist and zoologist. Um, so Helianthus natalii is, uh, or a Nuttall sunflower, is one of those plants that grows in moisture areas, so wetlandy, around ponds, near rivers, things like that. So it, it is, this is one of those native plants that is not xeric. It needs some water. So if you have an area by a downspout or an area that doesn't drain well or, uh, you know, anywhere where you have more moisture than the other parts of your yard, this might be something to consider. It's uh, hosts more than 40 caterpillar species. It blooms in late summer into uh, late September. It's usually gonna get to be two to six feet tall. Sometimes it gets up to 12 feet tall, but it really needs a lot of water to do that. <clears throat> and uh, a foot to five feet wide. I've never seen them more than a, a foot wide in our area, probably because they're not getting that much moisture. But uh, in any case, that's a if you if you have some place that does have a lot of water available and a lot of moisture, this is one to consider. Ariagonum jamesii is uh, what they call James buckwheat or antelope sage, I guess because antelope or as Camille Dungey pointed out, they're actually called pronghorn uh, are known to eat this plant. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a really great kind of ground cover plant that's really good for fronts of gardens, hell strips again, because it's a very low water plant. Uh, it goes really nicely with the Colorado State Grass Blue Grama, which you see in the background here. Uh, and it naturally occurs with that. So one of the things we like to do, uh, or at least I like to do in planning native landscapes is copying nature's plant communities. It's it looks good because they're you know they're they naturally occur together, so they look right together. And not only that, they're used to the same conditions, of course. So you can usually it if you if you draw from the same plant plant community, the likelihood that they'll all survive. Um, if you've matched the conditions properly is quite good. So <clears throat> this one serves a lot of invertebrates, both the larval and adult stages. 
it has a special value to native bees, according to the Xerces Society. Uh, and I see lots and lots of different kinds of bees on uh, my James buckwheat. And it's, uh, it's for the full sun. It takes very low water. I never water mine. Uh, once, once they're established, they just go and they do uh, reseed themselves, blow around, re, you know, plant in other parts of your garden, which I think is great. Uh, and it's a it's a beautiful plant, and I didn't include a picture of what it looks like in the fall, but it has a really beautiful rusty color. The both the 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 dried uh, flower and seed heads and the leaves turn a kind of rusty color. It's it's a pretty plant in the fall and winter. Um, it does like uh, really any kind of soil you want to give it as long as it drains well, so gravelly, sandy, or clay. Uh, and um, yeah, so it's a it's a good it's a good choice for the fronts of your borders. Any place you need a small plant that's kind of has a ground cover effect, that's a good choice. Uh, cousin to that uh, uh, is the sulfur flower buckwheat. And uh, this one is going to bloom. It's one of the earlier things to bloom in the garden. Uh, I would say it blooms in earlier June. Um, a lot of references say June to July. I would say it's pretty well done by mid-June in our area, but you know maybe I'm wrong. <clears throat> It hosts a lot of larval stages of butterflies, uh, several species of butterflies, and also adult stages of lots of pollinators. It takes full sun and very low water. Most of these plants that I'm showing you are ones that don't require any kind of supplemental water once they've been established and the, the give it you know the first year or so of good watering, tapering the water back, and then you don't have to water them again. If you want them looking their best for all of these where I say you don't need to water it, if you want them looking their best, then I would water them once or twice, you know, good deep watering in July and August once or twice is plenty to sustain them and have them looking their, looking their best. Um, but they do fine without, without water, even in drought, they'll survive. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, GM triflorum. I don't know how many people are familiar with this plant, but it is the coolest. I just love the the shape of the flowers is so interesting. <clears throat> and uh, pollinators are really drawn to this plant. Uh, you'll you'll notice in this list that I've given you giving you the predominant color is yellow, but there are there are a lot of uh, other colors available that are heavy hitters for pollinators. They might not necessarily be hosts, you know, really strong host plants or keystone plants, but they're wonderful pollinator plants still. So, but this one is uh, important to pollinators, the larval stages, at least six specialist butterfly species uh, uh, are uh, develop in these, uh, in these plants and eat the leaves. And it caters to adult stages of two specialist butterfly species. So you can see the shape of the flower would uh, determine what kinds of pollinators can get at them. And uh, so you can see this one would be the, the, the tongues of butterflies would, would work, whereas maybe bees, big bees, aren't, big bumblebees aren't gonna be able to do anything with this. So um, that's another thing you wanna think about is you have different shapes of flowers that cater to different things. Um, in the yard, and so this is a good example of that. So this one likes gravelly, sandy, or clay soil, and uh, what I was trying to provide a list that does have that kind of flexibility with soil texture. Uh, although you know we have lots of native plants that like things one way or the other, either clay or sand or you know rocks. So, but I'm trying to give you a good number to choose from that do well in almost any soil. You'll always see this caveat, well draining. Um, and it's a, always a good idea to uh, do a little drainage test on your soil to make sure that you're, you know, to, to get a sense of how quickly your soil drains. And if uh, anybody wants information on how to do a test like that, I'll be happy to provide it offline, give you my email. 
So this one is a sh relatively short plant, um, only up to 15 inches tall. It doesn't get that tall in my yard. It stays right around, I don't know, eight or 10 inches probably in my yard, but I don't give it any extra water. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it's an interesting plant you might wanna consider. Heterotheca velosa, the hairy false golden aster is a terrific plant that grows wild all over the foothills by my house. It blooms May through October. So it's one of those terrific plants that's always going to be cheering up your garden. It's uh it's it flowers prolifically for a long time. A host plant for at least six caterpillar species and more than 50 native specialist bees uh, need it. It likes gravelly, sandy, or clay soil. Uh, this is another one with a ground cover habit. It's a terrific ground cover. It'll get to about 12 inches wide. I've seen it get a little wider than that, but generally speaking, 12 inches wide. And it grows natively with fringe sage, with which it really looks great. I think they make a really great combo. Um, so that's uh, definitely one to consider that has a lot of uh, ecological value and a lot of horticultural value. It's just a terrific garden plant, I think. Uh, purple prairie clover you might be familiar with is a is an important uh, prairie plant for us. It serves 12 specialist native bee species. Uh, this one prefers to have a little bit more water than I give it, um, but it it hangs on. It, this is a this is a picture from the River's Edge native plant gardens that we did in 2019, and uh, it's still going strong there. And we don't water. We haven't watered that at all since uh, 2020. Was uh, sometime in 2020 was the last time it got watered. So uh, this one will hang on. It will do. It'll perform better, bloom more, get taller if it's watered, like most things. But you don't have to water it. Uh, this one is a terrific choice, I think, for hell strips. Again, it gets 18 by 18 ish, um, and the color. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these in person up close. The color is the most unbelievable neon orchid purple. It's just a stunning plant. And I think I showed previously there was a slide that showed a younger um, bloom of the flowers where you, these are all the, the floor florets have all opened up but sometimes there's a you know, earlier in the stage there's a big cone at the top of the flower so it's got a neat uh, interesting progression as it develops so broom snakeweed is uh something that ranchers detest um Farmers detest it's it, it's I, I hear from Larimer County agents that the there's lots of people trying to get rid of this. It's uh, too bad that it's that it uh, bothers them so much because it's a wonderful plant for a keystone species serving 72 specialist native bees. So this grows wild around my property and I love it because I, I often suggest it for people that are looking for something that's similar to rabbit brush but way smaller. Uh, because this only gets to be about two feet by two feet and uh, usually shorter than that. So it and it all it tends to keep a very neat mounded round habit. So you don't have to prune it. You don't have to do anything. I will say that it doesn't live very long. It, they each plant lives probably three, four years, but it does reseed itself. So if that's something that interests you, it's a fabulous plant that might take the place of a larger rabbit brush if you don't have room for that. Uh, Tufted Evening Primrose is one of my favorite plants. Uh, blooms early early May. Uh, the references say it blooms May to August. The, the best bloom is going to happen in late May, I think. Um, and then uh, it will bloom sparsely throughout the rest of the season through August. It serves uh, 11 specialist bees. And if you're familiar with hawk moths or they're also called sphinx moths or hum hummingbird moths, that hawk moth larva depends on this, uh, the, the genus, this uh, family of um, primroses 
they they need them to survive. So uh, if you have this in your yard, you'll see both the uh, caterpillar form of the hawk moth and the hawk moth later on in the season, which are really fun to watch. If you've seen those hummingbird moths, they're really fun to watch and they're huge. Um, so it, another one that takes full sun, it's got terrific drought tolerance, uh, gravelly, sandy, or clay soil, another terrific one for uh, health strips, if you're looking for that sort of thing. And the other thing I really like about this plant, it has the petals are heart-shaped. So how perfect is that for loved ones? <laughs> uh, Missouri goldenrod, I'm running, I should probably quick get through this so we have time for questions. Uh, Missouri goldenrod is another one. Uh, the goldenrod species are all wonderful pollinator plants. Two in this area are particularly good. The Missouri goldenrod, um, you can see the details on it there, is the, this is the one uh, species that is the, that survives with the least amount of water uh, of all the goldenrods. So if you have a really dry area, this is the goldenrod for you. Uh, its uh, sister is stiff goldenrod, which has a very different uh, leaf shape and a different flower shape. Uh, both of them are tremendous pollinator plants that serve a lot of caterpillar species, a lot of specialist bee, bee species. And it's too bad I didn't use the picture that, had, that showed this covered in bees, but this is a picture from a uh, specimen we have down at the River's Edge uh, Native Plant Gardens. And if you go by that area in August, this thing is covered in bees. A very, a lot of different types, a lot of sweat bees like it, uh, wasps, there's all kinds of bees on there. The Symphiotrichums, uh, any kind of aster in this group, this genus, Symphiotrichum are excellent pollinator uh, supporting plants, serving specialist bees and caterpillar stages. Uh, we have two from our area that are, are white ones um, that are very common in the plains and foothills. This uh, Ericoides is very, very common. The flowers are quite small on them. Um, I don't know what the, how the picture does. The leaves and the flowers are quite small, so less, less than an I would say less than a half an inch. These are these are small flowers, but there's lots of them. Um, and the other species at the bottom uh, that I'm suggesting is the white prairie aster that looks very similar to this. It has a different leaf. Uh, they are very similar in their performance and their support for pollinators. Uh, a blue version of the aster is our smooth blue aster. It takes a little bit more water than the white ones. But uh, as you can see, it's a lovely plant that attracts a lot of uh, pollinators. And uh, I think, um, yeah, so it will do, a, do well in any kind of soil you give it. And I, I would recommend though that you do give this one some supplemental water in July and August. Willow species are some of the top. You look at look at the number of caterpillar species that they uh, they serve. Uh, willow species are enormously important to the ecosystem. Unfortunately, they take uh, quite a bit of water, so generally uh, they're difficult to put in our yard. So they both take a lot of water and they take a lot of space. But if you have room and you have a place uh, for uh, that's moist in your yard and it gets more water, you can't go wrong with willows. Uh, coyote willow is a tremendous plant. If you have room for it and can accommodate it, I would highly recommend it. The boulder raspberry, oh, we're getting into shrubs now, so uh, we're getting through this. Uh, better pick up the pace. Um, Boulder raspberry is a really beautiful shrub. The, the scientific name is Rubus deliciosus. It does, it is, does not taste delicious, I'll tell you that. Um, animals seem to like it, but humans do not. It's a small, very small fruit on this that has, uh, it's predominantly seed, uh, but it, it's a terrific plant for supporting wildlife, including caterpillars and specialist bees, as you can see. Um, Beautiful, beautiful plant. Uh, 
Saskatoon service berry is always recommended as a terrific pollinator plant. Uh, you'll see if you go shopping for a service berry, the sizes are all over the place. Um, so you you never quite know what you're going to get with a service berry unless you're you're getting one of the cultivars that's uh, been bred to you, you'd know what the what the specs are for it, how big it's going to get, what shape it's going to be, and all that stuff. Um, but uh, multi stems, if they're wild. Uh, straight species, we call them uh, regular old native plant, multi-stem service berries get to six to 12 feet tall and 68 feet wide. And like um, most of our flowering shrubs um, and, and fruiting, fruiting shrubs, they will, they tend to colonize, they tend to want to colonize an area. So they'll send up suckers and start to create a thicket or a colony. So when you're buying a native shrub, you have to be aware of that and make room for its spread. This one spreads less than some of the other ones, like the plum and the choke cherry. But be aware that there are cultivars of a lot of these um, native plants that that uh, may not be as good as the straight species in serving the invertebrate species. There's not enough science, not enough science that tells us yet. Uh, what the dis differences are uh, in how they serve the wildlife, but um, but there are cultivar cultivars that will give you a better sense of what you can what you can inspect what you can expect in terms of total mature size, and uh, some of them have been bred not to send up these suckers. Like there's a a choke cherry <clears throat> called sucker punch that uh, does not send up suckers like we're used to most of our choke cherries sending up. So in case you're interested in that. Um, so the uh, Western sand cherry is a wonderful shrub that gets four to six feet tall and four to six feet wide. It has beautiful glossy green leaves and pretty white flowers in the spring and serves over 200 caterpillar species and has a special value of native bees. The golden currant is uh, one of the best native shrubs you can buy for this area. It's beautiful. It doesn't spread like a lot of our uh, fruit, fruit trees and shrubs do. It kind of stays in the space that it's allocated, getting five by five, and it will, uh, it, You'll see a, you'll see it attract hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. Uh, special va value to native bees, according to the Xerces Society. I can't recommend this shrub highly enough. The the fruits are wonderful if you can get them before the bee birds do. Uh, it's a and it smells it smells wonderful too. This plant. So just a few grasses because when you're when you're doing a native garden, you want to make sure you're including you know the diverse spectrum of plants so you want you want uh, trees if you can if you can manage them shrubs flowering plants grasses annuals perennials you want the whole spectrum if you can and grasses serve we don't often think about them as pollinator plants but they serve a major function in hosting uh, the larval stages of a lot of important um, pollinators for this area. So most of our native grasses will be host plants, important host plants for uh, lots of moth and butterfly species. So uh, one of one to think about using is uh, Cytotes grama. It's called Cytotes grama because the seeds, oops, the seeds kind of line up uh, along one side of the stem. It's a beautiful plant that has, when it's blooming, it has uh, red and purple components of its florets. So when it's flowering, there's almost a purplish, an orangey purplish cast over it. It's really a pretty, pretty plant all year, uh, even in the winter, but you know, when it's flowering, it's, you know, it's particularly attractive. Um, the state grass of Colorado is blue grama. Um, this is another one really important for larval stages of satyr and skipper butterflies. And um, it has, it's flower, when it flowers, these things, these uh, flower heads are, are maroonish. So it's, so it gets a little purplish when it's, when it's blooming. It's a really pretty, 
pretty plant in flower. And then as it ages, these flowers will curl. So they look like uh, eyelashes. A lot of people call it eyelash grass. And switchgrass is another important plant for our area, serving larval stages of skipper butterflies. Again, uh, this one gets a little tall and broader. It tends to take a little, mo little more water, but there are native species or, uh, that grow around me that don't take, that grow really tall and wide with no supplemental water at all. So um, it's a terrific grass if you, if you were looking something a little bit taller and wider. This is a great one that looks terrific year round. It turns a tan, tannish yellow in the, in the fall, a uh, beautiful plant over the winter. And here's another one I'm sure you're familiar with in the winter. It has this rusty cast, the little blue stem, uh, one of our uh, important plants for supporting larval stages of these butterflies. Um, it's a fantastic landscaping plant, as I'm sure you're aware. It's beautiful, uh, interesting color during the growing season. And then when it starts going dormant, it's this beautiful rusty color and it has white uh, fluffy seed heads that birds like. Terrific plant for the garden. And uh, Indian rice grass is a less familiar native grass and it's cool season, so it's one of the first seasons to get first grasses to get going in the season. Uh, and it, in the wind, this will this looks just beautiful when it's blowing in the wind when it's in seed like that. And it's called rice grass because the seeds look like little grains of rice. Uh, and uh, so uh, again, as you can see, all of these were important for larval stages of butterfly species in our area. So. Um, just some concluding notes. Uh, I wanted to um, encourage you to retune your landscape aesthetic. So we get our heads around ditching the generic landscape that's using plants that come from who knows where, that the landscaping industry has told us they work great in everybody's garden. Well, these, these are better for your gardens and landscapes. Uh, functional is way better than being just ornamental and adding functionality to your ornamental landscaping is definitely possible. Uh, native plants look right in their setting, like this picture depicts, I think. it's These plants just look right in the Colorado setting. And we should be celebrating our unique, the unique characteristics of these um, plants and the local environment they're in. And one last thing we should consider more and more, I think we should think about the history of the lawn, what it represents, and that for so long, it's been really a symbol, symbol of environmental hostility, the way we pump it full of fertilizer and insecticide and pesticides and everything else. So I just wanna encourage you to kind of rethink the way you think about planting your landscape because uh, this might be better for all of us. And you want to plant a diverse landscape. So you're planting in layers that mimic la nature, tree canopy, shrubs, grasses, ground covers. Copying nature's plant communities is always a good, uh, easy trick to ensure more success and make sure everything works cohesively. Um, and it, you also, when you're thinking about pollinators, you want to think about making sure you got something blooming from May to October. Uh, choosing the right plant for the right place, that all goes back to the whole ecoregion idea. So think about what kind of soil you have to offer, what kind of moisture you have to offer, what kind of sun exposure you have to offer, how much wind there is. All of these things go into determining which plant is going to work best for your location. And think about that when you're shopping and try to match the preferences of the plant to the conditions you can offer. Group your plants into hydrozones. So if you are going to water, the plants that need very little water get very little water. The plants that need a little more water get a little more little water, and you're not mixing those. So you're giving one plant too much that it you know doesn't want. Shop with a list of scientific names. I can't uh, emphasize that enough. It's so important because the vendors put so many different common names on these. It's it's hard to pin down what you're getting. 
or what you're looking for. Sometimes they can't help you if you give them a common name they're not familiar with. So try to try to have a list of common names in your pocket that you shop with. Avoid the big box stores for getting seed mixes because those seed mixes are not for your landscape. Just to, that's enough said on that. And we have terrific seed vendors in, in Colorado. Western Native Seed, you may all know. Miss Penn's Mountain Seeds is a wonderful family-run business that uh, has some really interesting offerings. Pawnee Buttes uh, out in uh, Weld County is a terrific resource in all plains. So try to use your Colorado resources for your seed sources. And of course, avoid, avoid the insecticides and herbicides. We, uh, If you plant the right plants, nature will do its thing and help you control the pests. So, um, so uh, I, I did want to mention too that shopping in, in big box stores for plant stock can be dangerous because that often uh, that plant stock has come from nurseries where things are pre-treated with insecticides. So you'll be introducing harm into your into your landscape that you were trying to help the pollinators, and you you wind up not helping them at all. So try to try to buy from nurseries that do not use insecticides in their plant stock, like the um, uh, High Plains Environmental Center and um, Harlequin's Gardens in North Boulder. And we have a number of uh, really good nurseries in the area. And I think that's it. I just want, I will provide this slide presentation uh, to you afterwards. So we have all the resources you can consult and um, I am ready to take some questions. Uh, there's at least three questions. One is from Ari um, Arietta. She's asking, are these all keystone plants? Uh, the majority of them are keystone plants. Um, some of them are just, some of them are, are heavy hitting host plants, I'll say. There are host plants that are critical for our uh, invertebrate population. So they wouldn't be, I guess, keystone species, but they are really important to support the uh, larval stages of some of so many of our invertebrates. They are high ranking host plants. And I, I should mention too that, you know, we have had, um, a number of studies done that help to identify these things, but they're not done yet. You know, that this, this is kind of early days with establishing, you know, what are keystone and counting all the bees and the uh, other invertebrates that uh, visit plants. It's I'd still, I would say early days. So we don't, we have not identified all, <laughs> all of these plants and we don't know all of the species that visit these plants. And we have not done, I, I have to, I have to confess that these are, kind of larger regional lists of um, keystone plants. They're not specific to Larimer County, but you can you can interpolate you know the results of larger studies to be uh, relevant in our area if it's you know generally the same region. So if that answers your question at all. Uh, Julie Julie Hellman asked, does the Rocky Mountain bee plant self seed? It does indeed. Um, it, it has one of the best, uh, germination rates of, uh, any plant known. It's nearly a hundred percent germination rate for the seeds that it, uh, drops. And it's one of those plants, it's an annual and it's a prolific reseeder. It will turn up elsewhere, you know, in different places in your yard every year. Uh, it's definitely, it's easy to pull if you don't like where it is, um, I happen to like those little cherry looking trees all over the place. So I let it do its thing, but yes, it will definitely reseed itself. Very good history of doing that. Yes. Okay. Kathy Hartman says almost all of these plants are full sun or light shade. Those of us in urban areas with lots of shade need some suggestions. Lots of shade. I have a whole list for you. Um, <laughs> and I, I thought about that. Um, Yes. Um, I thought about that when I was doing this list, that it was heavily focused on the full sun. Uh, and it was a lot of times what 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 I think I was addressing was the 
the a, a, a different way of looking at xeric gardening because xeric gardening is so popular. I wanted to give another way of approaching that is you know strictly you know, hyper local natives. What can we do with those? And so many of us are always looking for these uh, filling these super hot spaces like hell strips. What do you do where you know things die so readily? So that's why I focused on those. But I have a, a list that I will share with everybody who joined us tonight of plants that do well in the shade. Um, I think um, I'll read a few of them off while um, just in case. So we have um, Kinnikinnik, if you're familiar with it. Kinnikinnik is also called bearberry. Um, mm -hmm. That's a terrific one for shade. Uh, Mahonia repens or Berberus repens. Oregon grape, it's called. That's another one, terrific one for shade and dry areas. It doesn't like wind, however, so stay away from that. Wax flower, uh, western snowberry is a shrub that does really well in the shade for flowering plants. Small leaf uh, pussy toes as a ground cover. Yellow col columbine that's not that's native to farther south in Colorado, but it's a Colorado native plant. Uh, the blue columbine that's native to this area as well as other parts of Colorado. There's a, pl a plant called harebell that's purple that does really, really well in shade. I use it a lot in shade applications. Uh, wild strawberry, the prairie smoke that we looked at that has those interesting reddish pink flowers, That's that does okay in a fair amount of shade. Um, and uh, pask flower, uh, it's not, uh, it's a very early flowering plant. You probably are familiar with it, um, but uh, that one does pretty well. And uh, I, I um, recommend it for shady, sorry. Can you uh, maybe send send us that? Yes, that, I will definitely. List. I will send you all the lists, so you ha you will have okay. that shady plant list. I wanted okay. to mention the the pass flower is a good one because it comes out before the leaves of trees uh, leaf out. So that's often a good one that for something some place that might be shady later on in the season, but early in the season it's not. Okay, I have two more things. One is. Um, this is on another subject. If you want to sign the petition to put ballot measure 89, the right to abortion on the November ballot, contact Kathy Wilson. Uh, and her her email is in the chat. And second, um, Arietta has a comment that I think comes from all of us. Thank you so much for your beautiful and inspiring presentation. You provided a new way of thinking and advocacy model, which invites thoughtful stewardship. Thank you. And I have one request, which is a little weird. I wish you could. <laughs> I'm living next to a beautiful area where they're building 400 new houses. And this is typical. And I wish that there would be some way of getting this kind of presentation, not only to be presented, but to be cared about by all of our HOAs. And all of the, you know, the, the places that are building these huge amounts with these, you know, the lawns, et cetera. Yeah. Um, it, it's more than an individual thing to, to get, to be able to make progress, real progress in this. But Kathy, I, that was a wonderful job. No. You inspired us all, but we have more, more work to do. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the nice comments. And I, I want to second that, Fran. I think that is so important. And it's it's difficult to get the ear of uh, developers and um, HOA sometimes. But I'll tell you, they're starting to come around. There's so many there's so many people that are interested in this. It's 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 people power. It's people applying the pressure to ask the questions. And it's and it also it, part of it is going to the nurseries and asking for these plants. That's another mm -hmm. another reason to carry the scientific names in your back pocket. So you can ask the nurseries, please carry this plant. Um, so uh, we have, we're, we're to the point now, I'm happy to say, we're to the point now that the area nurseries that stock native plants are running out of stock earlier and earlier in the season. That's fabulous news. And I, I think mm -hmm. it's it's a hopeful sign that the word is 
getting out there. It's spreading. People are recognizing not only not 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 only the importance of this for ecological reasons, but you know you can save a lot of money <laughs> with the water mm -hmm. bills, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and we all come at this for different reasons, different motivations. It might be the water situation motivating motivating some people. It might be pollinators motivating other people. But you know we all we all have an interest in it, and uh, the more we can speak up and ask for things, the the better. I, I was once told by somebody in the city of Loveland that they don't offer an incentive program for lawn replacement like the city of Fort Collins does because there isn't enough interest here. Okay, okay. I have to add. Uh, okay. We know that's nonsense. <laughs> well, Kathy Hartman pointed out, and I didn't know this, and it should encourage all of us, that the Loveland City Council last night passed a resolution oh. to to, to begin developing a climate action plan. Oh, good. And good. so we really need to put this stuff that you've been telling us into that. And I, I think we have, from what I heard from some of the campaigning uh, for those city council members, there's there's some keen interest in, in these type, types of things on the city council now. So I think we have some receptive ears there. And I think, um, you know, some frequent conversation might just help us make some serious maybe, progress. Maybe we can send your presentation to some of the council members. <laughs> and, you know, it's very easy to email all the council members at once. It's on the city of Loveland website. So even if you say, even if you send them an email through that system and say, Hey, we want you to do this. Here's some, um, links that you can go to, you know, to give them information and the link to this. I'm well, we will be sending the link to the video for this presentation to everybody that registered for, you know, for uh, this meeting tonight. So look for that. And Kathy, I think we can, in that same email, um, uh, also put links to um, some of the resources that you that you gave us. And then we could forward those links to the city council members? Very easily. <laughs> it's <laughs> easy to email them all at once. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ted, uh, Ted Reaper has asked something at the very bottom, are showy milkweed and butterfly milkweed suitable plants? They're absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, so they are they are native. The um, butterfly milkweed is native. I don't think it's a native for Larimer County, but it's native the farther south in uh, Colorado. Uh, I'm not positive about that. I don't think it's native to Larimer County, but in any case, both of those the showy milkweed definitely is. It grows out by my mailbox. I never planted it there, and uh, so. <laughs> It's uh, both of them are terrific plants for the garden. And I, I don't, I, I'm i not a militant native plantsman. Uh, I see, you know, I see room for a lot of variety in gardens, non-natives, natives, uh, natives from different areas. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't wanna say you should only be planting native plants in your garden and native Larimer County plants. There's room for a lot of uh, flexibility there. So I would highly recommend both of those species for uh, uh, a home garden landscape. They're terrific plants. What I, I will mention, I wanted to say about the butterfly milkweed uh, and, and showy milkweed. Milkweed has a, a symbiotic relationship with a, a certain type of aphid. Uh, they're bright yellow. The I'm thinking of the butterfly milkweed in particular bright yellow aphid, yellowy orange aphid. Don't be alarmed when you see these aphids all over your plant. Just let them be. They coexist <laughs> there. And if it really, if it really bothers you uh, and, and you think, or if you do see the health of the plant is suffering, um, you can always just wipe them off with a gloved hand um, is, you know, squish them, um, knock them to the ground. They don't have a good, good way of getting back up on the plant. I understand, 
but just I just want to mention that don't be alarmed when you see some of the shoots covered in these bright aphids. They're not, they usually don't really harm the plant and they're serving a purpose in your ecosystem. So um, it's something we have to get used to again because we've been so indoctrinated to just kill, kill, kill anything that's, you know, if it's an aphid, get rid of it. But, you know, aphids have an important place in the, in the ecosystem. So I just wanted to point that out because that's something that shocks many people. Kathy, we you. are enormously grateful for this. I think we've all learned a lot. You know, we'll have to relearn it again. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. Well, there's the, these re, these resources in the um, that you'll get in the in the materials we send afterwards. Uh, there's so many good references out there. So many good resources, and I have to say, Larimer County uh, Extension Services and the the references we have, the, the CSU is terrific with the, the material they provide. If you're interested in putting in a native uh, native grass lawn or just uh, choosing native plants, the, the webinars they do on watering your yards, they're all so very valuable. They have a tremendous amount of helpful information. So I encourage you to look at the CSU uh, extension website and Master Gardener's information for uh, help. Um, I often consult them. I think they're terrific. And you have a gardening question, ask the, you can post the question online and the answers are tremendous. They're really, really good answers. So I encourage you to take advantage of that resource because uh, uh, we have, is Vaughn here tonight? No, uh, I don't Vaughn, have Vaughn is a master gardener in our uh, South Larimer discussion group, and she is a master gardener and uh, specializes, I think, in trees. And so she's one of these people that will answer your questions when you write in to, you know, ask uh, gardening questions. And please do take advantage of that service. It's really wonderful, really wonderful. So thanks again, everybody, for coming tonight. I appreciate your interest and uh, your attention, and uh, I hope the resources we send out afterwards will be useful to you in planning your gardens this year. And don't, feel free to contact me if you have specific questions. I uh, lo obviously love talking about this stuff. I'll be happy <laughs> to answer your questions the best I can. Thank you, Kathy. All the comments now are thank yous, and okay. thank you'll you. be getting more. Um, actually, put in your email. Uh, oh, okay, sure. So that people can ask you. I think that's it for tonight. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks Good night. very much, Kathy. Kathy Wilson. Thank you for the support. Thanks for the intro, Fran, and thanks for all that information, Cindy. Get us up to date. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Good night. Bye -bye.